Hey everybody, Ted Forbes here with The Art of Photography and today we're doing a split episode. If you only follow The Art of Photography podcast on iTunes and you don't follow me on Twitter or that kind of thing, you probably have been missing out. Uh, this week, kind of on a dare, actually it started last week, uh, I've been starting to do a photography vlog or video log or video blog or whatever you want to call it. And the idea was is that with The Art of Photography, I'm trying to breathe a new life into it, a little bit of fresh air. Uh, try some new things. So I thought just for an experiment, what I would do is go ahead and for an entire week, uh, every day I would post a, um, I would record a video. So just a vlog post, if you would. And I've only been posting them to YouTube. The reason why is, is if you subscribe to the Art of Photography feed, I didn't want to bombard you with video all of a sudden and uh, make it more than you were willing to handle. And so uh, again, I'm only doing this on YouTube right now, but uh, I was thinking about it earlier today and maybe what the solution is would be to offer the vlog as a separate podcast. If you're interested in this or you'd like to see it, and this is kind of for the iTunes folks, uh, let me know in the comments. You can go over to YouTube or send me an email or get in touch somehow and, and let me know your thoughts on that. Uh, I, again, I didn't want to put it in the separate blog and, and or the separate podcast feed, but then also we kind of have you know the argument of, okay, now what makes the vlog different than the art of photography? And the art of photography is a little more produced. Uh, you know, It's a little more thought through. And uh, the vlog is very off the cuff. It's very, you know, just whatever I'm thinking that day. So sometimes, uh, and actually, uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the results so far. We, we've, we've covered some pretty deep ground and I've gotten into some discussions with people via comments and email that I haven't had earlier. And it's been pretty cool. We've had some video responses even, which is really neat. Uh, so, you know, leave your comments here, record a video response, whatever. Um, keep the conversation alive, so to speak. Um, anyway, I thought this would be a good topic to post into both feeds today, into the vlog post. Uh, it'll be off the cuff like they all are. And I thought about this a little bit, so I guess I lied. It's not totally off the cuff, but it is more casual and it's less thought out. And I've had a couple requests. Uh, people have asked me to talk about a subject that if you've ever been into street photography at all or followed the work of uh, the French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson, um, I've had people ask me if I could do uh, some episodes on the decisive moment and what that means and what that is. And the decisive moment is a great topic. Uh, and I want to do this, I was kind of thinking it through, I want to do this in two parts because I have an opinion on the decisive moment that may not be so mainstream. And it's okay for us to disagree on that. It's, it's fine. Uh, we may agree on it. Who knows? Um, but if you're not familiar with what the concept of the decisive moment is, uh, you need to look at the work of, um, of Henri Cartier-Bresson. And I will put some links uh, in the show notes if you're watching on iTunes, and I will put them in the YouTube feed if you're watching it on the YouTube. Uh, wherever you're watching it, uh, check the links. And uh, anyway, Henri Cartier-Bresson was uh, is kind of known as one of the world's greatest street photographers. I, I really don't like the term street photography. It, it has a weird connotation to it, and I think people have taken that in, in strange directions. I won't go into that right now. Uh, I, I remember talking with um, with my friend Michael when we did the last London meetup, and we were we were agreeing that you know social documentary is a much better term for it. It's, it's, it's more what it is. Uh, but anyway, uh, photojournalism is kind of what this spawns from. And guys that were photojournalists who would go out and anything from war coverage to, you know, social documentary is what they were, what they were doing. Uh, and Bresson's work is, is considered probably the best of the best. Um, he's very well known, uh, often emulated, um, usually not exactly or very well because he really was that good. Uh, he died oh gosh, in the 90s, I believe, uh, but had a long career, huge legacy, actually gave up photography towards the end and concentrated on being a painter. And he was okay as a painter, but his legacy really lived as, as, as a photographer. Mostly black and white work, uh, just absolutely gorgeous. There's a ton of books you can find. Uh, I'll list a few in the show notes uh, that you can check out. And uh, anyway, just genuinely wonderful material. Um, Anyway, all that being said, uh, Bresson used to talk about, uh, and he spoke about it in a lecture, and you can actually buy a DVD of this lecture. I have not seen the whole thing. There is a preview clip on YouTube that I'll put a link to. And Bresson describes what he calls the decisive moment. And I think this gets a little bit misinterpreted sometimes of what this actually means. But it's something that's very important for photographers to understand. Um, it's something that I'm constantly working on. I'm constantly thinking about, it, especially when I'm shooting people. Uh, and basically what the decisive moment is and what this implies is that the moment the photo is made or the moment the picture is taken, 
it's a moment in time that could never be set up, it could never be replicated, and I think all that is true. You are seeing literally a slice of 1 60th of a second or 1 30th or whatever your shutter speed was. You're seeing that moment in time. And Bresson, his philosophy was that that is important for the photographer to understand that that is indeed the decisive moment. So if you're going to make a quality image, an image that means something, um, it, it, it has to happen in a fraction of a second. Uh, it, it's, it's literally just a point in time that something came together and made a beautiful picture. Now, taking a step back, and, and this is where my opinions start to wander a little bit about this, uh, and I've studied a lot of Bresson's work. Um, if you look back at some of the earlier episodes, again, I'll link in the show notes, if, uh, to some of the podcasts I've done where we really pick apart Bresson's composition technique. Um, he's very uh, conventional in a lot of ways, and I don't mean that as an insult. Uh, I just mean that his compositional style, he was trained as a painter um, in classic traditions, and you see a lot of just uh, real obvious rule of thirds, um, golden mean, uh, you know, things like of that nature. And that's, that might sound derogatory, and I do not mean it to be that way. He really followed a lot of hard set classical compositional techniques. And it really adds a sense of beauty, a sense of organization to his work. It's not chaotic. Um, if you want kind of the antithesis of that or a comparison, and I've also talked about his work on the show, this other guy, uh, this gentleman named Robert Frank, who was also shot in a photojournalistic style around the same time, probably a little bit later than Bresson started. But, uh, but anyway, Robert Frank's work is really the opposite of that. Yes, it is slice of life scenes. Uh, he's best known for his seminal work, The Americans, which was actually a Guggenheim fellowship uh, that he took and was commissioned to travel to America in the 50s and shoot just, you know, this seminal set of photos interpreting American life in the 1950s. And his work is completely different. It doesn't follow any compositional standard necessarily. There are some, but, but it's really not about that. It's more raw, it's more in your face, it's more, uh, sometimes it's ugly, sometimes it's harsh, uh, sometimes it's not fair, sometimes it paints pictures of life that are really, you know, the ugly side of things, but turning that into something that's very beautiful in a documentation manner, really. And so, if you look at these beautiful images that follow these classical compositional techniques that Bresson made, does that mean that Robert Frank is any less of a photographer because he did not follow those? In fact, it's almost like sometimes he went out of his way to avoid them. Um, I can't verify any of this. I didn't know either of these two gentlemen, um, and I'm not going to assume that I can tell you what they were thinking, so uh, to be clear about that. However, um, it does not mean that Robert Frank's work is any less wonderful or less important or less part of the canon of great photography. Um, it's just two kind of polar opposites that exist on this same field. Both of these gentlemen, uh, I think every photographer needs to know both these guys. Um, they're, they're more, obviously, I'm picking out two of hundreds of, of great photographers. But, you know, for we're talk talking about the decisive moment, I think Robert Frank is a wonderful contrast to, to Cartier-Bresson. Now, what I think has been happened, and again, this is going to be a, kind of an opinion of mine. It is not fact. I'm not basing this off of any interview I've seen with Bresson or anything. This is just kind of an opinion I've formulated. But seeing that Bresson's composition followed, you know, this, this classical tradition uh, that was very beautiful, very conventional, very... Just, just rich um, in a compositional sense. Uh, it's not disturbing, it's intriguing. It's, uh, you know, where Robert Frank does go for the disturbing sometimes. All that to say is that I think there's been a common misconception that a lot of people believe that Bresson improvised everything and that he just had this wonderful talent of always aligning this perfect image, uh, whether it be rule of thirds, whether it be golden mean, whether it be, you know, whatever that is. And I just don't think that's possible. I think that Robert Frank may have been more possible in his off-the-cuffness. In fact, if you really get into the book, The Americans, you'll learn that Robert Frank actually ran into some trouble when he was shooting in the U.S. and, uh, you know, was threatened a few times, uh, you know, by police and people who didn't want their picture being taken. So he really was, I believe, more off-the-cuff maybe than Bresson was. And again, remember this is opinion. And if you disagree, please leave a note in the comments. You're free to have your own opinion about it. And I'm just kind of giving you what I give. Now, what I do believe about Bresson is that he was so steeped in that tradition 
knew what he was doing and had such a gifted and trained eye, plus he was an extremely talented photographer, that you know it's possible that a lot of those shots probably weren't set up too much. Um, he was looking for that constantly through the viewfinder of the camera, um, and those are the shots that ended up being his decisive moments. That's the point I want to make for everybody is what was a decisive moment to Bresson may be a different decisive moment than what I would interpret to be a decisive moment or what you might or what Robert Frank did or what you know Cornel Capa or you know anybody else who was you know kind of an improvisatory if I can say that photographer particularly from that that golden age of, of photojournalism style. Uh, I don't think that that makes his work any less valuable. Um, in fact, I kind of praise Bresson for going the extra mile. For instance, there's a very famous shot that you can find anywhere. If you do an image search on Google for Henri Cartier-Bresson, it'll come up. Uh, it's probably his most famous photo, and it's a guy jumping over a puddle. It's been raining, and you see a reflection. There's Everything follows the golden ratio, the golden mean. Uh, it's this perfect photo. And I kind of have a hard time believing that Bresson just happened to be there and picked up the camera and snapped it. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. Uh, it could have been that he saw that that could be a possibility and waited. Um, I'm sure that happened a lot. I'm, I don't know if it was for the specific shot. Uh, it could have been that he saw somebody walking by that he said, hey, you know, I've got this great photo I want you to do and, and instructed the, the model, so to speak, to jump over the puddle. There could have been some slight things like that. One thing that's interesting, and I haven't, and, and I have to admit too that I haven't researched it just too much, but I would love to see some of the contact sheets from, from Henri Cartier-Bresson's work. Um, the contact sheets are, I have seen for the Americans. Um, there's not a lot of outtakes. Um, it, these guys, and I, I wouldn't believe that Bresson was a machine gun style photographer. It's, it, it's not that. It's not shooting everything you see and waiting for the decisive moment. But it's interesting if you were to see the contact sheets, and I know there's a book that has just come out, which I don't have yet, uh, that is on famous Magnum photographers, which Bresson was, was part of that group, one of the founding members actually. Uh, but it released some of the contact sheets so you could see how these scenes change. Now, I do think that there was, uh, I'm going to guess here, that Bresson had an efficiency to his work. I don't think he would fill up a whole role on one shot, for instance. There are photographers that do. It's okay to do that. Uh, obviously, you want to n glean away from the machine gun style of photography and start to develop your eye, understand composition to the point where you can improvise a little bit about it. One thing I, I, I've done before on the podcast that, that I'll do again here in this episode, which I think is really important, is, you know, I have a music background, uh, whether or not you know that. Um, I was a jazz guitar player at one point in my life, and, you know, I, was, I got a degree in that. I was studying it in school. And... I was studying the, the, the famous jazz improvisers, the Miles Davises, uh, Charlie Christian for guitar, uh, Wes Montgomery, um, John Coltrane, you know, all these greats. And one thing that's interesting is, yes, they are improvising, but they're improvising within uh, kind of a set uh, group of restrictions. Okay, so they're improvising within a framework. You understand what notes work over what chords. You've played the song enough to know the chord progression and that has an impact on how you interpret the melody you're going to make up as it goes along. Sometimes it's things that just come out of your head. Sometimes it's things that you are formulating from a music theory standpoint. And I think photography can be similar in a way. Uh, it, it's kind of like the, the old adage, you know, you have to learn all the rules before you can break them. And I think that's important to understand in photography too, to learn the compositional structure, compositional rules, uh, you know, very traditional things. And even if you're in the more of the mindset of Robert Frank where you're trying to divorce yourself from all that, you don't know what you're divorcing yourself from if you don't understand what those things are. Um, or in the case of Bresson where you're playing with those, uh, with those elements, with those traditions, uh, which I, I firmly believe that he did. I just think those things were in his head all the time, you know, and, and even though he's kind of improvising in a way that, you know, you're, you're, you're in a social setting whatever that is, whether it's a major world event or whether it's just a couple people on the street that you happen to be shooting or whether it's relatives or, or, or uh, nephew's birthday party or whatever that is, and I'm putting this into the global context for all of us, is that, you know, constantly you have those things in mind. Um, it's amazing too because I, I, a very good friend of mine who's a photographer 
who was a little bit of a mentor to me when I was getting started, my buddy Ray, uh, he had mentioned to me once that, you know, it's amazing, he was giving me a little impromptu photography lesson, this was early on, and he said, you know, it's amazing how many people don't actually look through the viewfinder when they're, when they're shooting. There's a difference between looking through the viewfinder and looking through the viewfinder. There's holding it up, kind of getting everything in the shot and shooting, and then there's holding the camera up, looking through the viewfinder, and understanding how to divide by three uh, in a grid in your composition. Understanding that if you put uh, certain elements that are prominent in that composition on those lines that they do stand out. Or understanding that you know, if I have something close to the edge with a lot of negative space, it draws attention to the thing that's close to the edge. There's, there's a, um, you know, a magnetism or a, a point of emphasis that's put on that. You know, all these compositional things, and I've talked about a lot of these in the show before. Unfortunately, you gotta go back and watch some old stuff. But, you know, uh, I think they're worth bringing up again because I think this is really the quest for all of us as photographers. And again, I'm not trying to bag on Bresson's work at all. He's one of my favorites. Uh, I don't really strive to look like him necessarily, but I definitely think like he does a lot. And that's an interesting way to be influenced by somebody, I think. Um, it doesn't mean my work is even in the shadow of Bresson's. I, I'm not good enough to hold his camera back, but, but that, that's what I strive for. And that's what, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants or, you know, whatever kitschy expression you want to throw in, you know, I believe that that's what puts you on the path of becoming a better photographer. And we've talked a lot this week in the vlog, if you haven't seen them, about thinking rather than reviewing cameras or uh, you know getting caught up in the machinery of it all. And that's really important. Um, I'll do another episode on the decisive moment. We're getting a little long already here. Um, and I want to talk specifically about um, a photographer who was probably my biggest influence, which is a guy who's very unknown, but uh, which is very unfortunate because he's also extremely good or was. Uh, and I'll talk about that next time we cover Decisive Moment. I might do it tomorrow. I might wait a couple days. Uh, we'll see because uh, I want to kind of prepare that because I do have some images to show on, on that subject, you know, primarily. Anyway, so all that to say, uh, just some thoughts on Decisive Moment. Um, do some research. Don't just watch my podcast and expect me to give you all the links. You know, Google Decisive Moment. Go find, go research, go, go look into it. Uh, but, but go deeper than that. I, you know, you look at somebody's work like Bresson, go find out what, what classical compositional techniques he followed. Um, there's stuff all over the web. I'll put some links below that'll get you started. And, but, but don't just go off of what is said. Like really try to put your own mind into it. Look at the images. That's the most important thing you can do. If you can't afford the books, go do Google image searches and, and really tear it apart and see what it is that made that particular photographer, whether it be Bresson or somebody else so special and how it relates to those things. Uh, go do work and find out what their biography is. I, I, I know that Bresson was trained as a painter. Uh, he went to school for it. So I know that he knew these rules. Um, I'm just giving some speculation that the way he applied them wasn't always as improvisational maybe as some people believe that it is. And I probably, this is probably very sacrilegious to even be saying this stuff because there's, there's I'm sure, some Bresson purists that'll come along and lop my head off for it. Uh, but anyway, once again, this has been The Art of Photography. I'm going to do this both in the vlog and on the episode, and I don't know where the heck I'm going to put it on our website, which is theartofphotography.tv. Don't forget, take care of some business here before I let you go which is weird after that was such a kind of a deep topic. Uh, but anyway, I have a mailing list. I'll put the link below. Uh, get on the mailing list. Um, we got the vlog going. We've got the regular podcast. We've got a whole bunch of things. We've got to meet up if you're in Dallas, Texas, and you want to come by next Saturday and, and check that out. Um, we're going to have a meetup. So anyway, you can find all of this information and more at the website, which is theartofphotography.tv. Link in the show notes or below or whatever medium you're watching this on. And we'll take it from there. Anyway, guys, uh, thank you so much again for listening. If you've made it this far, we're at almost 20 minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm always blown away that people actually, uh, you know, care what I have to ramble on about. But anyway, uh, I will cover a part two of the decisive moment because I think it adds to it. And we will do that in it another episode when I have longer to talk. So anyway, once again, thank you for watching. <laughs>